Hey, man. Hey, bro. How you doing? Doing well, man. Good to see you as always. Good to see you too. Good to see you too. Still coming uh, to y'all from a basement in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm coming from a walk up in the East Village of Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. It's the Brown Jews Barbershop. Just trying to get together for some conversation. Uh, always a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Uh, you know, just to share time and space and looking forward to getting into a little something. Yeah, right back at you, man. I love these. All right, I see. Uh, what, what you got rocking over there? Ah, Stax History is Black History. You know what Stax is? I don't. Stax Records? Hmm. I educate don't the you. youth. I got to educate the youth. Please do. In Memphis. Okay. Isaac Hayes. Otis Redding, mm -hmm. uh, everybody recorded there. A company that started, you know, Memphis is like the so Soulsville is called. Okay. So much good music came out of there. So much good music. They, they say like Motown was one sound, you know, disco was there. Um, when you got below the Mason Dixon line, it was a new kind of funk. Mm. And it was, a, it was a funk, a Southern funk. Mm. And um, you had all those folks coming out of there. Um, Booker T and the MGs used to cut from there. So it's all this really, the music that's really like goes hard, you know, and pushes real deep. So Stax Records was a company that did all this stuff and they put out all this music. They, if, you, if you you have not seen, you must see, this happened after the the, um, the riots, after I think MLK was uh, murdered. Hmm. Uh, they're trying to figure out what to do. And they did um, what was called Stax, Stax, um, Stax, Watt Stax, excuse me. It's a documentary called Watt Stax. And it was a concert, whew, incredible concert um, that happened in, in Watts. They went there, got the stadium, had everybody come out. It was mind blowing, mind mm. blowing, mind okay. blowing. Um, okay. And so, and there's a famous scene, a woman is in this red dress. She has on polka dot dress. She's just dancing. The camera just caught her in the stadium. And it was like the most beautiful moment, this deep, dark chocolate brown woman, just like going to the music. And it's, it's beautiful. And I, I may have that. It may not have been after MLK's assassination. It was after a number of riots in America. I know it was after some rioting period, and they needed they need something to bring people together. Um, and they had this Watt Stacks event, and it was just mind blowing. And Isaac Hayes closed it out. He came out in this like gold to the floor vest, <laughs> and these gold hot pants with like vinyl, just uh -huh. killed it, uh -huh. killed it, killed it. Really good stuff. So Watt Stacks is. Um, a place so sex history is black history. If you, I'll show you the back. This is the first time. Uh oh, look at those commands. Talk about it. You see all that? Dance like Rufus, protest like Megan. Yeah. I see you. Okay, exactly. exactly. It's the people. It's the people. That's where Rufus, Rufus, who worked with, with that Shaka Khan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of them. Like, if you wanted to get a certain kind of music, you went down and you played at Stacks and, and delivered. And it's all, it's all rooted in like southern gospel music, BB King all the way to this like funk that happened from, at the right time, right moment. And all these folks from the neighborhood will come and play there. Mm. Yeah, okay. fantastic. Well, thanks for sharing that. Cause you know, I wasn't familiar. So I, I appreciate that. And I'm Can sure- Get you to Memphis, man. Can get you to Memphis. Listen, I need to get to Memphis for the history. There's so many sites I need to go see. And for that food, Ooh. I gotta go for that food. Mm -hmm. There's a place I'll tell you about that like, we go to um, in Memphis. Oh man. Come on, it's coming to me, it's coming to me. And it says, little family dining, family restaurant. Oof. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> they fried chicken like I haven't had since my grandma. Oh, hey now. I'm gonna get the name and tell you that place. We okay. go, to, we took our travelers there every year. We used to go to like this other place that was kind of a chain that is like good. Okay. Now, wait a minute, what's that little place you just drove past where I see, I saw cop cars, I saw like the municipal, employee cars hmm. and I saw sister so-and-so and it was lunchtime and I was like um that food's going to be good mm -hmm. look who was in the parking lot mm -hmm. and went in there and man oh man oh man oh man oh man there's yeah. nothing like a, there's nothing like a good meal particularly when you're traveling oh forget about it. nothing forget like it. a good meal if you can have a piece of home forget yeah. about it. it's amazing it's amazing yeah Memphis Memphis is a great city and uh the food there's I have a barbecue I have a few barbecue spots to take you to there also Okay, well, we, we, we out. We yeah. out. Only been in Nashville, but Memphis, Memphis, that's next. Memphis is next. <laughs> hey, what's on your shirt? Who's that? I see a hometown. 
got the I'm so Harlem shirt. I had to dig in the crates for a little bit. You know what I mean? This is one oh, that okay. I picked up back when I was in, I think, I think I want to say high school. Got it from 125th Street from my dude who had the little table outside with all his shirts. You know what I mean? Probably doing his own screen prints and et cetera. That's my dude. Um, I had to get one in like every color. I had a black one, a gray one, a red one. I, once I met my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, I'm like, listen, I need to, I need to get you with some nice threads. You know what I mean? I got to get your I'm so Harlem shirt. You know, so I brought her back a pink one and a green one. You know, so I was, I was spreading the Harlem gospel, so to speak. So um, 125th Street, one of the places that has just been like the mecca of Harlem. Yeah. Um, and you know, so much history. You get anything. anything. You're absolutely right. Anything. Yeah. Anything you're looking for. They got good food. Um, you got entertainment because you have the street artists. You have folks who are performing. This is one dude. I can't remember his name. I think his name was Mr. Green. I think his name was Mr. Green. But he was always like, whether it was between 125th Street and 135th, that's why I would see him all the time. And he'd be walking around with like a suit on. No shirt. Just like a suit jacket and pants with like some nice boots, right? With one of those little like bouncy balls you get from like the machines, like the 25 cent machines. Uh -huh. He would have the music on, like he'll have a little boom box and he'd just be doing his dance and stuff, be dribbling and everything. My, my goodness, my goodness, I miss me some Harlem. Pretty gentrified Harlem, you know, magic. but I miss me some Harlem. Magic, magic, magic. magic. Yes, sir. How the about whole the food is the now? You know what that? you think? Because the whole food is the 125th. You seen that? I, listen, so <laughs> what I have been told is that the signs of gentrification, right? is when they pop up the Starbucks and they pop up the Whole Foods. And it's like that Starbucks is right there and right here is the Whole Foods. Across the street. And you got the Planet Fitness above. Yes. So, man. What's heartbreaking is the, is the, um, the, Le the Lexican, Le Lexington Lounge was across the street from all that stuff and that's gone. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's gone. That's, that's gone. gone. Uh, um, further down on 135th, um, Pam Pam, where um, yeah. uh, Alicia Keys filmed the, um, the video, You Don't Know My Name. You Don't Know My Name, yeah. Oh, my goodness, yeah. it burned down. Yeah. Allegedly. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's another show. We can go on for hours. It's, <laughs> it's still, but it still has it. When I go there, you can still feel it. Oh, yeah. It still has it. Oh, yeah. It still has so, it. All right. Well, let's get into some brown, man. Oh, yeah. Um, I ha so I have a bottle of um, Wild Turkey Rare Breed on my bar. It's unopened. I don't want to open it yet. I'm saving that for like when I need it. I respect it's that. Like, I just want to, you know, because, you know, quarantine in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, um, you know, there are some things that are also quarantined. They got, they got the brown. Non-essential. Non Non-essential. <laughs> they've, they've got, so the brown juice is quarantined too. So I might have to holler at some, really? of, the local, some of the local distilleries in PA, um, like Kinsey. I might have to holler at them and do a little, uh, give me a little care package um, so I can come equipped for the brown juice barbershop. So right now I'm just, just kicking it with my Elijah's friends. back. Elijah's, Elijah's back. back. Elijah's back. I decided to find a remnants of a party. Hey now. Big old bottle. Hey now. Look, can't go wrong with the makers. Gotta stay on the mark, right? Got to, got to. My, um, actually my, um, so each year I try to have a birthday bourbon, right? Um, and I was going to get myself a birthday bourbon. One of my favorite birthday bourbons is Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. Um, and before that, I had an old granddad 114. However, this year, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, they blessed me uh, with a Maker's Mark Private Select. Wow. Um, so, yeah, that, that was a good bottle. So, shout out to them. Want to do a little hey. cheers? Cheers, man, to you. To you. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Maker's Mark is a... That's one of the ones that it tingles on your lips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, don't you remember you drank me? <laughs> it's classic. Got the iconic, you know, hand dipped wax. Oh, completely, completely. It's great. That's the yeah. other thing I want to do. I want to take a trip to Kentucky um, and if, you know, maybe go to some of the uh, distilleries. But we have to have yeah. enough folk with us, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, and, and before the sun goes down. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I don't know if you had a chance to, um, have you, did you hear about this, uh, this TikTok fiasco? I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. Well, I'm, 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 I'm going to call her, uh, I'm going to call her TikTok Tegan. You know how they have like, you know, backyard Becky, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to call her TikTok Tegan. So there's a couple of students um, at a school in Georgia who filmed the TikTok video talking about how to create an N-word, right? And they're pouring things into the sink, oh. such as like add this, add that. So there's a lot of backlash, of course. Um, and 
now, you know, she's begging for forgiveness because they're like, they tagged the university that she's supposed to be going to. And they're like, we hope you don't accept students like this. Um, so that whole thing is playing out right now. So, you know, Play my wife game. and I have a conversation. It's like, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. What do you think? So it was a couple you're, of You've been a missions person in the past. You were mm -hmm. a missions person. Yeah. So what I would say is that because I'm, I'm, so I have a number of different perspectives that I will look at it in terms of like run policy, admissions, um, what's good for the institution. Um, but what I would say is, and also like in my religious background as a Christian, I think that, you know, I believe in the power of redemption. Mm -hmm. I believe in that. I do believe in forgiveness, but not so quickly because mm -hmm. I think you have to atone for what you did. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm an admissions person who was at her college, one, she got expelled from her school and getting expelled in the era of COVID-19 looks differently, right? But yeah. you got expelled. So you didn't complete your high school requirements. So what does that look like? That's one piece. Two, if we already offered you a letter of admissions, would I rescind the letter? Again, I'm trying to balance... Mm -hmm. the redemption piece mm -hmm. so what i would do to make sure that i'm doing right by the school as well as doing right by this young student who's supposed to be growing into this human being who can be valuable and change etc i would say i'm deferring your admittance for a year mm -hmm. so i'm not going to completely rescind it but you cannot come to my school this year mm -hmm. what you have to do is make sure you take x y and z steps mm -hmm. and over like next year We'll mm -hmm. evaluate to see if you're able to be admissible. Mm -hmm. so I won't just throw you away mm -hmm. because I also, I want to call people in. I don't just want to call, call them out, right? I want to call out the behavior, yeah. but call them in and say, change. If you really say that you're sorry, change. Show, yeah. I need proof. And then we can reevaluate that as opposed to just saying, done. Because I think that, um, and not to go off topic, but I was reading like a number of different articles before and they talk about the difference between, you know, when does free speech become hate speech? And you talk about cancel culture, et cetera. Is canceling something or some, something that someone did the best approach? Does it really solve issues or does it do more yeah. than good? So I would yeah. want to confront it and say, if you really say that you're sorry, prove it. Yeah, exactly. Do the work. Mm -hmm. do, the work. do the work. Do the work. Like, a, 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 like an apology and an apology TikTok ain't the work. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's not the word. Thank you for doing that. I Here's appreciate that. Here's an apology. We have this. We have this. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now I need you to go read this book, attend this seminar, study this, study this session, talk to these people, really turn your ways of thinking and acting around and come to me explain why people, why that was problematic and explain to me your, why, like this is, this is how you really get them to the next level. Explain to me why what, why the action you took was perceived as okay by you. Mm, mm -hmm. That's how you get somewhere else. Mm -hmm. you break it down to me why it, you thought it was okay to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not, and like really break it down from an historical perspective. Love it. That's how you get in there. Cause yeah, cause I don't, I'm also, I mean, there's some people you gotta do like, go away. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's some folks, especially children, they need lessons and, and training to keep, I mean, the, the large number of young men that took part in the KKK went there because they were so rejected by everybody. And they found a community. I had a young man that I mentored that went down this path. Mm. You know, and all of a sudden, like he he was talking, this kid he had a really problematic home, white kid in Pennsylvania, like Eastern Pennsylvania, hard time. Uh, and he started talking, this is all on social media about how blacks need to get jobs, this and that, and all this stuff. And, I said, listen, and I was like, where are you getting this info? And I just have some new friends. We were talking about stuff. And I started digging deeper. And then he really, this, these men were surrounding him with love and support, telling him he's great, he's okay. And his response was like, yeah, black people don't work hard. Black mm. people don't try. Mm. Welfare exists because they don't work. And I was like, um, mm -hmm. where, where are you getting your information from? Read this, read that, let's talk. And he went away for a year because I, like, I was like, I can't deal with it anymore because the stuff you're saying is problematic and dangerous. Mm -hmm. And he's just returned, like just returned. We haven't talked about it, but he's like, hey, for what you know, I'm not somewhere laying in a ditch and I'm doing all right. Mm. Wife and I got my little business. And I was like, great. We haven't had the, I have, we didn't have a car because I, I just, I just dead it. I was like, I can't. So anyhow, all that to say, pushing a person away, you might be pushing them in the arms of a bad place. Take care of yourself and don't try and fix every darn thing. Find, 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 find a space within that. I 
That, well said, well said. I think that that's really important. Really important to look at it from you know all perspectives. You know, can't save them all, and it's not your it's not your responsibility to save them. All. Right. Um, but you do what you can, so you can't do anything else. And you know, make sure you look at everything in a case by case basis because they're all not created equal in that sense. Oh, completely. Mm -hmm. completely. Since we now that we dealt with that very serious issue, mm -hmm. I actually want to even take it up another level. Okay. But you have something else you wanted to ask? No, me? no, no, no. Please. So you know, in these times of COVID nineteen and our need for connection and community and support. We had a moment last night that's important to talk about. Um, Babyface versus Teddy Riley. <laughs> How do we heal from this? Listen, um, you know. Take your time, brother, take your time, take your time. <laughs> let me tell you how important this was. Um, we had people doing commercials. Uh, we had folks getting their outfits, or as they say, their fit lined up for the evening. We have folks putting it on their calendar, right? We had people who were looking forward to this. Like they were looking, they didn't have anything else on their calendar really, except for at 9 p.m. or at six or wherever part you were in the country or the world, right? We gonna watch us, two of the greats, two of the greats. Now, my wife threw me an impromptu date night, right? Oh. At home. It was really cute. Yeah, you know, yeah, little yeah. candles or not, everything was cool. So we at like 920, we're like, oh snap, we late. No. <laughs> no, we were not. We were early. Very, very early. And what we were oh. what we were welcomed by <laughs> was a bunch of nonsense and chaos. We had my man. On the non-social distancing cabbage patch. We had my man, someone said, God, give me the serenity to dance like that guy in the back when the world's burning. I believe that was uh, comedian Kevin Fredericks. Yeah, kept on stage. I'm like, fam. My man, listen, when he heard that it was going to be a battle, he brought the crew. Now, yeah. I would have respected it a little bit more if they had masks on. Because if you're not going to social distance and you don't have your mask on, <laughs> it's like, your man, he's like, oh, it's the mic. No, I think it's you, Babyface. And oh, prayers to Babyface, because I, I need that patience. He was like this the whole time. No, no, don't, don't do that. We shouldn't do that. No, <laughs> I think, OK, can you hear me? I think we shouldn't. Wait, can you hear me? No, we shouldn't do that. When they said, when they said, we going to come, everybody log off, come back in an hour. And he was like, no, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> Uh, Teddy, uh, right. Teddy, Teddy, can you hear me? Teddy, exactly. My, it was like, amazing. Woo, but it was you incredible. saw how many people were in the room? It was like 460, 490,000. Because the world was ready. I, this is the moment I knew it was serious. I saw this woman said, Yo, I'm home. I can't go to the beauty parlor and I wash my hair myself. And she wasn't a natural girl. She's like, I wash my hair. She did it, Miss Jessie's curls and stuff in it to make it like flow. I mean, I was like, ain't nobody going to see you, but that's how much it meant. Mm. Like, that's how much it meant. This and I was is, like, yeah, this people is were at home. Like you said, that's how much it meant. People, you had celebrities like, like Tamar Braxton. She was like, I put shoes on today. <laughs> I put on shoes. You know what I mean? Did the makeup, you know, let the hair up. Like, everybody was ready. And the, the sad mm. part is, they have hits on top of hits on top of I know, of hits. and talent for days. Talent for like, days. We, I mean, it's, I mean, it, and it's, it's, a, it's a moment of, and for me, looking at D Nice's career, mm -hmm. you know, because I still think, every time I hear his name, I, I get the mm -hmm. NIC, and I get the, I get the, I take it back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, when he was doing that. Like that's, and he just, I think the first thing he was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I am in the kitchen. Yo, let me go. He's going, wait, Michelle Obama? Okay. Oh, some Halle Berry. I think he says Halle Berry like every three minutes, but that's another story. <laughs> he, and he just did it. And it just went simple. I mean, his hats were his thing. Now he got shirts. Mm -hmm. got had an NBA, had a voting one. I was like, it was dope. An article, interview in the, in the LA Times. And so I think everybody and their mother now is like, it's kind of interesting to see everybody going on yeah. performing. I'm like, yes. you don't have to show us 
everything you can do, but okay. And those two, I was like, okay, this is a beautiful moment. This could be a healing moment. Yes. This would be powerful and fun. Everybody loves. They're going to see some, oh, that's my jam. You can be in your house. You can like going. And, and all these, all these have this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, we, you should know that this is live so people can still hear us. That woman who spoke, it was incredible. The best meme I saw um, was that it was a picture, baby face, like with the earbuds like that. And Teddy Riley like that. And they said, yo, this is like watching your parents trying to use Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ooh, that hurts. My that hurts. goodness. My, but, and, and, and the irony is you have two of the best, like, producers and talented artists ever. Writers, performers. Writers, performers who should know their way around AV and things of that nature. And it's like, you think you would have done a sound check or would have tested it. And would have, like, especially with so much promotion and all this leading up to it. Ooh. Now, I'm going I'm to I'm say this, and you can have your response. Mm -hmm. Maybe a contentious moment for you. Um, it's been discussed that Mr. Riley is from Harlem. <laughs> and people in Harlem are known for doing too much. <laughs> <laughs> Please respond. I love to hear your response. <laughs> this <laughs> uh, on behalf of the Harlem delegates and Harlem delegation, I would say that yes, uh, he is one of ours. Um, and on occasions, there are times <laughs> when we might do too much. Now, it's not that we do too much per se. Um, I think it was a nice plan. Beautiful execution. Plan. Now, if he would have followed through with the execution, we wouldn't be talking about him doing too much. We'd be like, wow, Teddy came with so much more than what we expected. Right. But he was team too much last night. Yeah. He was team, team, team too much. Baby had on earbuds and in his studio and was like, okay, let's go. Because this is what the world looks like right now. Babyface could pull in a universe. <laughs> Talk and about make it. Happen. It. Multiple cameras would be, be multi distant. But he said, nah. Uh, <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. It was, listen, it was funny because I was sitting down and my wife was like, listen, they because in the comments, the comment section, like, who won the battle last night? The comment section. Yeah, the right. comment <laughs> section won the battle last night. My goodness. For days upon like, days, man. so many jokes. The man was like, oh, yeah, they're going to make memes tomorrow within 10 minutes. The seconds. It's already happened. When it, when it happens, somebody, somebody wrote, this is going to be the meme. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it was on. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't so, wait. To see what one of the funniest memes I saw was like, if 2020 was a sound check. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That was the funniest one I saw. I'm like, wow. <laughs> wow. Fantastic. Mm -mm -mm. Fantastic. What a moment. What a moment. I think, I think it's, and I'm glad that we can laugh at it. Because it, like, it was like, wow, this is going to be like revolutionary. This is one of those. This is one of those moments you wish for, and it, and because it, for that to happen, it would take like lawyers making contracts and this and that, a venue, a place, five hundred dollar tickets, mm -hmm. exclusions, all this stuff. But this is like, no, come on, we're gonna do this right now, me and you, let's go. And they they they, they did too much. They did too much. Keep so, it simple. So I mean, Look, no one, no one. On Instagram, you can, I mean, you put your phone on a, a player system, but the sound is not going to be good enough mm -hmm. for a whole studio band and performance. It sounds so. I appreciate them making effort. I can't see how they come back. They got to come back. I mean, yeah, it, it, like it's, it's rough. And because, especially after D Nice went in and saved the day, and it's like <laughs> he played the set, you know what I mean? I mean, I, he didn't play all the hits, but he was playing lots of the hits now. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Like, it's a, but it's, a, it's such a great bit because D Nice, D Nice didn't have D Nice. His career was kind of like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, he was playing. Mm -hmm. He was he was one step above bar mitzvahs, from mm -hmm. my understanding, mm -hmm. with major talent that mm -hmm. wasn't exposed to it. It needed to be exposed. Mm -hmm. And now, mm -hmm. just which is so beautiful, just by being himself. Now, wait, he's from, is he from New York, right? He's from Jersey. He's from, he's from Bronx. I think he's from the Bronx. Bronx. Okay. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, he's from the Bronx. So not Harlem, is that what you're saying? Not, not Harlem, but I was born in the Bronx, raised in Harlem, you know, so I claim that too. Born in the same place of hip hop. Um, yeah, that's on my resume. Okay, work it out, work it out. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. So here's the thing. So we're talking about battles, right? And this battle that was supposed to take place yesterday. I got to do this to you. 
I got to do this to you. Oh boy. You get two tickets. Oh boy. You get two tickets, but you can only put them towards one of these concerts. Who are you going to see? Erica Badu or Jill Scott? Oh man. Uh, the last concert I actually went to was Erica Badu at um um what's the the Met? Okay, she was amazing. She was great. She was excellent. She was excellent. Um, I have to go with Jill. I love Erica Badu. I love Erica Badu. Like that's my she's she's my she's. She's my familiar. Mm -hmm. I listen to her music and I get every little, even at even Worldwide Underground, a friend of mine was like, you like that album? <laughs> and I said, yeah, he said, I knew you would. I knew you would. And I was like, what? He was like, come on. Do you know what Prince said to her about that album? No. He said, Eric, come on. You didn't finish that album. And she was like, what? <laughs> Prince was like, Eric, it's not a finished album. It's you. And he started singing some of the songs. She was like, like, what do you say when Prince said to you? Yeah, wow. I'm gonna do it. Anyhow, wow. love Erica Badu, but um, I would say Jill Scott because she's from North Philly, mm -hmm. where I'm from, you know, and I know she gives a good show. She has an amazing voice, and I haven't seen her live in a long time. So right now, ah, I have to go to Jill Scott. Mm. How about you? I haven't seen either one of them live. Um, so like, I just, I would love to see either one of them. Um, you know, my response would be like, Jill Badu or Erica Scott. That would be my, my <laughs> no, You can't do I, that, you can't do that. <laughs> then, and neither one, would open for, neither one would open for the other. Yeah, no yeah. way, that would <laughs> no way, no <laughs> way. <laughs> open for, excuse me? Neither would <laughs> <of them. laughs> maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe this is, maybe this is bad to say, but um, I would, I would, hmm. I would, I would want to go see, well, is it, is it, this is tough. This is really tough. You asked the question. <laughs> this is tough. So it's like, you know, maybe, and this is, this is what I was saying, where I was going with it. I was like, maybe this is bad to say, but if it was like Erica Badu, right? And her baby daddies. Okay. Like, Get about it. you know what okay. I mean? And, or, 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 or people like she's, she's dated in the past. I'd, I'd be seeing Erica Badu, Common, Andre 3000, Jay Electronica, so that like if it was like she's the headliner and those folks opened up. Now yeah. Jill Scott, Jilly from Philly. Yeah. If it's Jilly from Philly and then the Roots made a cameo. Oh, forget about it. I just, I mean, I just forget about it. So and and because I I remember like I don't know if there's beef in the streets between them. I don't think so. But I'm just saying in the sense of uh, you know, you have I think Jill Scott was singing on, um, well, Erica Badu sung on the Roots joint, You Got Me, but Jill Scott wrote it. <laughs> and hearing both of them, it's just, at the end of the day, I'm in the point of life, the stage that I'm in my life right now, maybe <laughs> Jill Scott, date night, have a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ultimately, yeah, yeah. ultimately. Yeah, yeah. yeah, my two Jill Scott stories, I remember, Back in the day, this is when I was at a film distribution company and the guys from Hidden Beach came to us to have a meeting. This is before it all came out. Like, oh, we got this new great singer, she's wonderful. We know she's gonna be a hit. <clears throat> and I was, our company had been acquired by Sony. So we're in a Sony building. So you had all those kind of interactions. A company called Urban World, um, the film, film festival and a film distribution company. And I was one of the, I was the head of, Head of marketing, I think. Mm. So Hidden Beach came over and they gave us a CD, and I was like, I've never heard of Joe Scott. She's from Philly. Oh, listen, I was like, oh my God, this, well, this is amazing. So before that, <clears throat> I was in Philadelphia, home from college, I think the summer after my junior year. And, you know, one of those nights we're running around, this is a place called South Street in Philly, which is where stuff is happening. Used to be back in the place all the hippies meet was a song. But now, now it's a whole different thing. But back then, it was like, you can go to little bars and see little shows. You got to hate me. <laughs> I went there one night, and the show was um, Q 
Q-Tip was DJing. Mm -hmm. The Roots had a band on stage and was playing. Eve came up and sang a song. Jill Scott came up and sang a song. Diggable Planets did two, 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 two jams. And, and I was sitting here like, I remember, I remember Fab Five Freddy and Chris Rock were standing there next to me. And I was like, what is going on? Like, what is going on here? What is going on? And we paid $6 cover. What? And the place was, I'm looking around your basement, the place is like the size of where you're sitting right now. Wow. No lie. It was wow. incredible. It was incredible. We all walked out like, I remember, all right, the thing I remember the most is Fab Five Freddy and, and Chris Rock were smoking a blunt. Like <laughs> the and I was like, hi, so nice to meet y'all. <laughs> Chris was like, you too, man. And I'm like, it was amazing. It was amazing. Oh, but that's what, you know, one of those moments, moments that I was like, I'm, I'm not going out. And when I'm, we were just walking up and down South Street, being kids in college, trying to find something to do. And we weren't like going to the big old club and all that stuff. And we did like, yo, the guy was yelling, so show up on the hill, you want to check it out. Mm -hmm. The music sounded bumping. And we were saying, like, oh, okay. Incredible. Mm. Incredible. Six dollars. Mm. Six dollar cover. Mm. Amazing. That's probably like the best six dollars you ever spent. Oh, completely. I remember that night so well. And I remember thinking, like, what is going on? But they were just mm. hanging out doing music. That's beautiful. Right. And it was very like, Eve, come do Eve, come sing a song. Come on, come on a minute. Come do it. Come on, come drop the lines. I know I didn't come to work. It was beautiful. Listen, beautiful. I mean, I I have memories of South Street because when I was younger, it's funny how life like takes you around and you come in certain circles that you've been at before. So, you know, I was in Philadelphia because on summer program I had a program called uh T Mark, was Temple Minority Access uh mm -hmm. to Research Careers. It was turned to the PSTP, which is a physician scientist training program. Um, and I used to stay at a temple over the summer for, you know, for several months or whatever throughout the summer. And I used to go down to South Street, you know, it was happening space, whatever. My experiences in Philadelphia when I was younger, and this is somewhat off topic, but, you know, I ran into Beanie Siegel. Um, nice. He cool. had been on a motorcycle, you know, had been a Broad Street bully, was out there on the motorcycle, got his autograph, and I left it in the dorm room. And oh. then, another story is I got my life threatened on a basketball court in Philadelphia. In North Philly, I got my life threatened. So I was playing basketball, right? It was like a Tuesday to me. <laughs> I was playing basketball, right? And, you know, I'm playing basketball. I'm driving to the basket, everything, you know, playing hard. Because I'm from Harlem. I got to represent, you know what I mean? Rock it, baby. What's good? So I'm over here trying to play, right? Driving to the basket. And then you got some old heads on the sideline. It was like, yo, touch my young bull again. And it's a wrap for you. Wow. I said, I bet. I want to make it back to the dorm. I started shooting jump shots for the rest of the game. I'm not dropping to the basket. I'm not checking on defense. We good. North Philly. I'm home. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> That's North Philly. That's North Philly. <laughs> so I, lo I love Philly. I do love Philly. That's probably my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. Man. I do, I do love Philly. As, as a dude from New Philly York, is amazing. Philly, Philly is, is like, it's a beautiful special spot. Place. It's a real special, special place. For sure. Yeah, man. Uh. Yeah. So, you ready for another toss-up? Oh, I, I am. I, I, think I, I think I may have one. All right, let's go. So, I want you to tell me about your rich cousins <laughs> that live in Jersey slash any suburb that had a fridge that had crushed ice and it actually worked and it had HBO on the TV. My goodness. I know you have. <laughs> so for me, it was, for me, it was uh, mostly my friends. Mm. My friends because I, so my, I have two aunts. Two aunts, no uncles um, from my, on my mother's side. Mm -hmm. So growing up, I didn't, I didn't have any like cousins. Um, but it was really my friends, though. Like, I had some friends who were, like, either middle class um, or they had both parents at home, and they were, like, really, really working class, working hard to make sure they could have certain things. And, you know, I was, a, I was used to seeing my neighbors in my building, if they even had a couch, having a couch with the plastic on it, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't fall asleep, catch a nap, you know what I mean? Wake up, it's a, it's a wrap, you're stuck. You're stuck. Um, but just thinking about my experiences growing up, 
where we didn't have the remote control. So we would like have to memorize like the numbers on the, on the cable box. You just go up there, you become real cool, was type it in real quick. Um, but going to some people's houses where they had like, like stainless steel, like when I saw stainless steel appliances, I'm like, they make that? Right. Says, That's not a standard <laughs> issue. Like that doesn't come with the apartment. Did you upgrade? How many years were you here in order for you to put in for that? Um, I remember when I saw a dishwasher for the first time. Oh, forget about it. I'm like, hold up, wait. So y'all put stuff in that, right? And you press buttons, and water comes from the sink, and it what? Wait, no, I'm the dishwasher. Like we, <laughs> we and we put it in the dryer. That was crazy to me. And then, like, forget about ice. Like, I learned all about like, cause my mother used to. My mother loved ice so much so that she would send me to the store to buy her like a bag of ice. To just eat ice, mm-hmm. just eat ice. So the ice, like the ice trays that we had, the the trick is this: you put a little bit of warm water in the ice tray, so that way they freeze faster. That was the stuff. Like, and you always try to make sure you can open the refrigerator door without spilling the ice tray, all that stuff. So when I got to a place and they actually had ice that you could press at a button, and it was like, what? I'm like, what is this McDonald's? <laughs> you get ice like that? Yeah. That's crazy, and you got a little light. So if you if you if you if it's nighttime and you want to go get a snack, and you also want like ice cold water. You put a little light switch on it next to it, and it, woo! There's so many. It's like it's like seeing a UFO. Oh, completely, completely. I I had I had cousins in Jersey. My father had nine siblings, mm. and it was our family was interesting, interesting. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but we did have some of his his first cousins' kids. Kevin, Sharon, and Eric, and they lived in Jersey. And they always, they always had like an annual like barbecue in the summer. I remember like, oh, we go to Kevin's house. And I remember sitting and thinking about that refrigerator, you know? Um, Cause they were, you know, living in the, living in the suburbs, the mm-hmm. suburbs to me. And, and at the time I felt like my rich cousins in Jersey, they probably laugh about that now. Cause they probably were just African-Americans who were doing okay living in the suburbs. Mm-hmm. But to me, it was like, wow, they have like all this land around their house and mm. games to play outside. Mm. And so we would go there. And I, I just remember, it's to the, the point now where I have a friend who teaches at a school I work at. Um, and I tease her all the time because she has a fridge that has like crushed ice. And I'm like, mm-hmm. ooh, I'm talking <laughs> about my light-skinned cousin's house <laughs> with the crushed ice. She goes, why I got to be light-skinned? I was like, because they were. And, um, <laughs> And I, I seriously, like, I, like, I think, especially now with the lockdown, I haven't been to it. I sit and think about it. No, no lie. I had them take a picture of them doing it. And <laughs> feel it. Because it was, they, they, I mean, we didn't please. We, you said cable box. <laughs> we were still pliers. <laughs> Got to get to it. You know, cable, I don't, I don't think cable happened until after I came home from college, maybe. You was on the wire hanger, making sure everything oh, was- Oh, forget about it, forget about it. Yeah, we, that they, but I, did, I also had some cousins in Boston. Mm. Tony, my cousin Tony met Ron, and Ron was like a principal at a school in, in North Philly, and they moved to Boston. He's a real academic guy, like real intense, and he and I had an instant connection as a little kid. And so they moved to Boston. Oh, you know, I was, I was a large kid. Yeah. I was 12, I was like 192. Oh yeah, like like five feet, if that. Hmm. I went to their house in Lynn, Massachusetts, one summer, and lost a hundred pounds one summer. Cause she, t- Tony, who's my first cousin and older, she opened the door. And she was like, "All right, see y'all at dinner." We had to go outside and play all day, and then dinner wasn't no soda. <laughs> um, and we had salad. I remember, I remember her being like, "What's what's all this green stuff on my plate? What's, what's, what's all this?" I didn't. I didn't realize that they were like dieting me and limiting me and getting just because wow. we were living in North Philly. I couldn't go outside because that man who threatened you, threatened to kill you. <laughs> I lived next door to him and his cousin and his son. I lived, that's why I lived around him. My, my, my grandma was like, "You are not going outside." Mm-hmm. And she was a she was an amazing cook. She was mm-hmm. an amazing cook. So I was just sitting there eating and gaining, like like right now. Um, with this, with this um, lockdown for the COVID. So anyhow, that's a long way of saying that um, I went to Boston to their house and they, they had, I mean, they were in a condo mm. and they had HBO. Mm. 
I remember where we watched like the Diana Ross concert in Central Park one summer. I thought it was like the most amazing thing in the world, you know? Because I was like, this is on TV. And I, we, we, I remember <laughs> one Saturday, we watched a movie called Saturday the 14th, which was like this horrible spoof thing. I thought it was I'm a like, I've never heard of that. Girl. <laughs> HBO back in the day, man. Yeah, so that that those cousins with the crush ice, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, well, speaking of like, cause cause that gets at a like, you know, it gets at money, financial security, maybe class issues, you know, working class, middle class, upper class, etc. It gets at all those things. So I guess maybe to close out our conversation today, um, something that I've been thinking about, cause I remember growing up, and one of the things I watched was the Chappelle Show. Mm. And one of the most like infamous, like funniest sketches was the reparations one. Oh my god! Um, it was just it was just <laughs> ridiculous. And one of the lines was, "You know what, Dave? It looks like uh, you know these folks are just breaking their necks to give us their money back, right?" So I'm I'm wondering, right, mm. using that as a a window into like what's happening right now with stimulus checks for those folks who are getting stimulus checks, right? Because it's not reparations, but those folks who are getting the stimulus checks. Um, if you were to be a financial advisor, so to speak, if you were to put on a hat and tell folks some best practices for how to possibly use that stimulus check um, wisely, what would you say? What would be your wise counsel? Man, you know, first I gotta get too deep and go over the top with it. Do it. And when I think of these checks, I think about a story that Vladimir Putin actually once told. Um, apparently he was giving a speech and what he did is he, had a, a live chicken brought to him mm. and he plucked it and the chicken was bleeding and going crazy and running around and like you know imagine a live chicken being plucked from an audience and then he put his hand out with some feed and the chicken came back over and ate the feed mm. he said let me show you everybody no matter what you do to someone if you pull a little something from them that they can have for benefit they'll come back to you mm. just fight through their pain right Mm. Right? <laughs> so, stimulus check. Mm. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> right? That's how I see that stimulus check. So, I think, and to answer the question, I think people should um, feed themselves, get what they need, take care of their um, emergencies. Um, I don't think it should go towards the cable bill and maybe not even the phone bill. But um, if you need supplies and food for your house, if your child has asthma, you need to replace something, um, whatever it is can be in place uh, for health, uh, that may be rent. If your landlord is not having it, I'll give you a break or a cut. Um, or, or your mortgage, you wanna fall behind, or some bills you can't fall behind further to keep your credit in place. I think people should use it for whatever they think they need it for. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and be really smart about it. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to comment on that critique because critique, I can't, yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, I, I doubt I'll get one. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, not, I'm gonna, not gonna see one. I could use it, honestly. Mm -hmm. Think about New York rent, that's mm -hmm. another story. Um, and being, being a person who's a gig performer, you know, my life relies on going to a room full of people coming together to hear me give a conversation, give a keynote address or watch a movie. That ain't happening anytime soon. So half my stuff been cut, but more than half my stuff been canceled. So I think people need to do whatever it takes them to um, keep themselves healthy, fed, um, and taken care of, and feel good about themselves. And also remember that story about that plucked chicken. My goodness, oh, that is real. When I heard that, I was like, "Dad, he did that!" Like that was that was that was one of his keynotes. He was one of his talks. Mm. Vladimir Putin is, is uh, I mean, he, the thing is, it's the truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. So. My goodness, I have, I have absolutely nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to add. I think, one, thank you for that story because I did not know he did that. Um, but talk about an analogy that is worth holding on to to share with other people. Yes. That's it. Um, and I, I absolutely agree with you in terms of, you know, um, folks know their need uh, more than we do. Um, and, you know, think about that need as opposed to the want per se, um, mm -hmm. or opposed to what's trendy, what's flashy. Um, you know, you know, you're, you know, you start to itch and you're like, oh, maybe I should go spend money on that. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, but just thinking about those things as well. So, like I said, I have, I have nothing to add. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask for one final toast as we wrap out. Let's do it. Um, this past week, two brothers I went to school with mm. left this earth, left this plane, and to them, to them, Eric and Akita, their families, everybody, you to know, them. stay strong. Blessings. Well, another another great session, man. Great Thank you with so much. For sure, for sure. Appreciate that toast too. And to everybody who's out there, you know, um, love, uh, thoughts and prayers to you and your family, your loved ones. And, uh, you know, we'll get through this thing together. Yeah. Thank you. I need this. I appreciate you. Likewise. Likewise. And until next time, man, it's the Brown Juice Barbershop. Hey. We'll holla. Later. Bye.